let me with great pleasure introduce you to our speakers for today from the Home Depot. We have Jen Huang. Uh, she's the director of online data science. Then next we have Rishali Bhandare. She's a data science manager. Next we have Yao Sun. She's associate data scientist, decision analytics uh, department. Next we have Megan Forrester. She's a lead, lead data scientist in the Home Depot. So with that, I would like to uh, invite Jin Huang first to uh, sh share her talk. So uh, she will have an introduction of data science at the Home Depot. So Jen, it's over to you. Great, um, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and bring the content up. All right, can I get a thumbs up if, if you can see it? Awesome, thank you for confirmation. Um, so very happy to have this chance to discuss uh, Home Depot's data science for uh, the larger data science community. And it's such a privilege to talk to uh, fellow practitioners in the industry as well. Um, I'm really excited also to see the mission of uh, women who code. Um, Home Depot pursue a lot of same core values, which is why I'm very excited to wake up every day and work here. It's very much about encouraging diversity. It's about pursuing uh, innovation and science in a very exciting space. So hopefully we collectively as a team would give you guys a overview of what we do. Uh, very briefly about myself, um, sort of growing up as a data scientist. So my academic background, both sociology and biostats has a very heavy data science um, or algorithm influence. Um, after I graduated from University of Minnesota, I went to work for Target, uh, built a lot of fun models. One of them got sort of infamous, picked up by uh, New York Times, where our model predicted actually if you're going to have a baby uh, based on your purchasing behavior. Um, obviously, this type of model widely used in personalized marketing back then, and then even more so now at much larger scale. Um, then I had the honor to come to Home Depot um, where we uh, had built a very large scale uh, A-B testing practice, uh, worked on data science platform. Uh, so a lot of work with our engineering team, understanding how they contribute to data science and then move on to sort of the new frontier of reinforcement learning. And of all these, you're gonna see more in the follow, uh, following slides. Great. So uh, what, real quick about sort of what I do for fun, I'm a huge outdoor person, really like to kayak and hike. Um, I also enjoy drawing and painting and uh, my husband and I collaborate on a children's book that we recently published through Amazon. So lots of fun work and happy that Home Depot encourage uh, work-life balance. So it <laughs> get me time to off on the river or do something fun. But um, coming back to data science real quick, right? So I don't know if psychologists, I, I don't realize this, but psychologists tells us we make more than 35,000 decisions a day. Uh, most of them, uh, you know, in an unconscious mind of ours. So think about this, right? If a customer comes to Home Depot site to try to buy something or even more complex, my toilet, let's say is leaking today, or I have a hole on my drywall, well, what do I do, right? Or if even bigger scenario, if you're going to move to a new house, how many decisions do you have to make? So in that case, right, data science often step in to provide to our customers a great experience. But what I wanted to emphasize on today is data scientist is a hero, but they're not the only hero to help with this decision making. So in the same process, right, we actually have a lot of unsung heroes uh, as well that's supporting data science to build a great customer experience. Um, what I wanted to share it with you is the actual experience we delivered at Home Depot and discuss variety of um, supporting areas as well as data science algorithm that goes into that experience to give you a full view. So without further ado, uh, here is our customer facing experience. Uh, this specific type of recommendation internally, we call it a visual similarity recommendation. So what that means is simply, if we have an anchor product, in this case, it's a lovely two uh, uh, tables, outdoor tables that's in blue. Uh, this is what our anchor product is. And we want to do product recommendation. And then so visually, we think those three things to the right are similar 
to the anchor product. But how do we get there? So the first question typically, right, is what makes something visually similar? So, so here's an example. I actually went to a chalk art fair this weekend and I saw this very creative 3D drawing on the, on the street, which is on the right. Uh, clearly it's a reference to Beatles famous album uh, cover, right, for Abbey Road. But if you humanly looking at these two things, are they visually similar or are they not visually similar? even though the reference is there, right? So what makes something visually similar when you consider as a data scientist to build that model? So to do that, there are lots of steps we go through um, and I'll try to step through them with you. So for machine to learn, the first thing we actually to, need to do is to teach the machine. So on this image itself, um, we have a significant amount of human labeling or teaching of the ground truth to the algorithm before the algorithm can even be built, right? So what are the labels we need to uh, teach? So here I listed out different sorts of types of algorithms. Some of them are what we call image classifier. Uh, this type of algorithm tells me if this is just a product picture with a white background, or if it's a lifestyle picture, like in this case, you have a lovely garden, you have wine glasses, right? That's a lifestyle image. We have object detection where you actually draw the bounding box for the image that allows you to put a border right around the picture, oh, sorry, around the product. Cl color detection is another algorithm. We need to detect it in the family of blue, uh, material and texture, shape, and style. Um, so for machine to uh, build these models, each of these element has to be human and labeled first. At Home Depot, we have a huge practice of human labels to help teaching the machine. Um, this year, we're all going to actually label over a million um, labels to teach all sorts of uh, algorithms. So that's sort of the step one, right? We have good labels. And then once those things are created, what we also do is we treat these pictures as first class citizens in a unique visual database. Um, and this obviously is a visual example. What I also want to mention is we have a huge practice in unstructured data as well as very structured relational uh, EDW type of database as well. Uh, so if you out there are data engineers and are passionate um, about how to uh, you know, build a very cutting edge, like image database has some very native image support, right? That's not uh, solved by a traditional uh, database. Uh, so if you want to solve those type of problems, this is a great space for you to play in. So like here we use a specific image type of database that has native support for uh, pictures or videos. Um, we optimize on the fly processing of the image attributes and a lot of them are in the embedding format um, it, or vector format rather than the original sort of the image file format. And then we want to enable easy integration of the image database to our ML framework, right? So can this directly be consumed by TensorFlow, for example? So lots of fun work in uh, creating a, a image-friendly database and do the updates and maintain right maintenance right there. Um, so beyond the image database, we also extend our knowledge in what we call a knowledge graph. So this concept is a core graph database concept. So in the graph database, very high level, you have something called a entity, which is each of these uh, uh, pictures I'm showing, put it that way. And then you have something called edges, which are the relationship. So you can see knowledge graph greatly extend our understanding for these two sets of end tables. So this, first of all, I know this set of table has the same brand as a table to your right, except that one is the espresso color versus the blue color, but they have the same brand, right? And the same basic texture. But in addition, they also share the same color with another type of end tables that's not metal, but it's blue in the color family. And then from a frequently bought together point of view, right? People typically buy candles or uh, solar-based lights to put on the end table for outdoor enjoyment. So those two things are frequently purchased together. And uh, last but not least, related to our customer preferences, 
We know customers who are preferring modern or bohemian style from a decorative style point of view would enjoy these tables. So as you can see very quickly with knowledge graph, we understand a whole set of knowledge related to this end table and this together enriched our understanding of the product and help us to do a better recommendation. And then now it's time to, for actual data scientists to go to work. They have the data, they have the infrastructure, they have the right label. Now they can go build whatever the model they like. We actually encourage them to, we provide them with on-demand computational power at Home Depot. So we're entirely on Google Cloud. They can request uh, GPUs, CPUs, however many uh, computational powers they need. And then they are encouraged to install and explore custom libraries, whatever the latest in the industry. They can install it, have full control of our, their own virtual machine and build whatever model they like. So in this case, uh, our data scientists build a multi-label classification model using a deep neural network uh, that basically intake style, pattern, color, and trying to do a visual similarity match between the input and the output. Um, after, let's say, the model is finished, what happens? Well, um, before we try if the model is good, we go through another round of human validation. And here's an example how we do that. As I already mentioned, color shape style is the input for the model. So we actually allow humans to tune these weights and then to see if the output is to their satisfaction. And then the machine could also learn from the human input of different weights to further tune the, uh, pro uh, the, the performance of the machine. And then we do a customer facing A-B testing, which means this is actually delivered live on our website and we'll closely observe, did customer like this experience? Did they click on it? Did they buy it? Did they just leave after the page or would they come back? and further data gathering help us. And this is a reinforcement learning piece, which is the latest thing we're pursuing. Uh, in the interest of time, I probably won't go into too much detail with Motor and Bandit, but long story short, if you're familiar with A-B testing, traditionally, right, A-B testing is like this first step. You're doing a randomized experiment, but in Motor and Bandit testing, you are continuously learning. Uh, so let's say on, the, on day one, you launch a randomized test. But let's say on day two, you realize the version three is actually doing much better. So what happens is I leave 10% of the traffic or in this case 9% of traffic to continuously do my randomized testing. But I start to send more people to the winning version, which is version three. And this is called exploitation because I know it's doing better than I can make more money with a better performing version. But this process goes on and on. So like, let's say in day five, version two become the winner and then version two will start to re receive more traffic. So this is a brand new version of doing A-B testing and we can also do customer uh, personalization through the same mechanism as well. So last but not least, right, I always liked this picture <laughs> because knowing how to use what you have is super important. So the last thing we wanted to cover is algorithm as service because that's the way I, I, we scale our limited data science resource. So let me give you a quick example, again, an image example. So in this image, we have uh, five different types of base algorithm. Uh, I kind of mentioned those before, like object detection or a color classifier. All these base algorithms are reusable. So think of them as Docker image or containers that's already deployed in the cloud as a service. Uh, there's a very easy API for you to use. You can simply send in your inputs and the algorithm that's already dockerized would return the output. You don't have to actually do anything more. But all the base algorithm would go to the next level algorithm for data scientists. So we actually have three different types of higher level algorithm that's using the base algorithm. So you saw visually similar earlier as an example. But at the same time, like we could also put product, generate product dimension and impose them onto a picture uh, instead of forcing customer to go look for product dimension in a string of text. So that's another use case. Um, but anyway, so I won't drain this slide, but I wanted to call out, if you look at the full life cycle, of machine learning uh, operation, it's truly a whole village. 
And we not only need data engineers, data scientists, we also need machine learning engineers, computer application scientists, uh, architects. So honestly, a lot of um, fun areas for anybody who codes to play in. Um, so uh, if you're interested, our team is 80 strong. Uh, we have a, a lot of patent. Uh, this year we are ranked uh, as the third largest company pub in publication and in prestigious uh, conference like KDD. So a very vibrant practice. And then uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to the next speaker who will cover our enterprise data science team who also has a lot of exciting things to do. Um, so Vrishali, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jane. So let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. Cool. So, hey, everyone, uh, happy Thursday. And actually, those who are on East Coast, it's soon going to be Friday evening, so even better. So before we begin, just to introduce myself, uh, I am Vishali Bhandari, and I'm with Home Depot. Uh, and as Jean mentioned, it is a great place to work with. It's a very exciting place, and there are so many cool and innovative things happening. I joined Home Depot two years ago, and prior to joining Home Depot, I worked in different companies across banking, finance, insurance, uh, in media, and work across different domains such as marketing analytics, sales analytics, media mix modeling, optimization. And when after joining Home Depot, I had an opportunity to work on very cool innovative project. And at my current role, uh, I am part of a market, larger marketing data science team, and I am leading marketing data science for some groups within our company. At my current role, uh, being a part of marketing data science, we work with a lot of customer data. So, and in today's uh, presentation, what I'm going to talk to you about how we apply marketing data science to personalize customer experience. We, work, we deal with a lot of customer data, and in today's case, I'm going to stick to the use case, which is related to digital marketing. And when I say digital marketing, it includes all sort of marketing, digital marketing like online banner, online audio, video, advanced TV, search, et cetera, et cetera. So when it comes to personalization, it's very important to understand who is your customer, what are their needs. And it's not always easy to understand what customer needs. And because of so many various reasons, like you know, changing customer behavior, changes in their preferences, macroeconomic factor, pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. And then you will imagine, then also you will wonder why it is complicated when it comes to digital media, right? If it is, everything is digital, you always have access to data, you can track, then why it's so complicated? But then before we go there, go there, let me, let's talk about what was the marketing scenario before and how digital marketing evolved over the period. In earlier days, you know, people used to use uh, you know, direct mail mark, direct mails or email, where we can, it's relatively easy to track who responded to your ad, who saw your ad, who redeemed your coupon. But then over the period, as world become more digitalized, marketers start leveraging all the digital channels. And over the period, as digital media grow, the market, digital marketing may became more efficient way to use very limited marketing dollars. And as it grows, as digital marketing grow, grew, it also become more complicated. And you will wonder why. So let's take a minute and think about it. Like how many places um, you, know, you generally visit in a week. I know it's pandemic, so most of us are at home, but think about um, you know, two years ago, every individual visits multiple, used to visit multiple places. Even during now, even during pandemic, we all visit different media, cha different channels, right? If you're working on some home, improve home improvement project, or you want to buy something, you visit say, different websites, or you visit particular website multiple times then every individual have multiple devices. It, every individual interact with different social media channels. Every individual have different email channels. And then even at company level, right? Even if you think about the company level, the number, number of individuals visiting the website, right? Could be, could be much higher. 
and then multiply that with the number of individuals staying in the house, then multiply by 52 weeks in a year. And that number could be much higher. And think about the scale of Home Depot, which is largest home improvement store in the United States or the world, right? So our database is huge. And when it comes to digital media, there are other complications. Unlike direct mail or email where we can track who saw your ad, who we bond marketed, there are some other complications in digital media like trackability or accessibility. And in such cases, if we are not able to understand customer needs or we are not able to predict what customer needs, we will end up targeting or marketing a wrong product to wrong customer or maybe irrelevant, irrelevant product to the customer. And it could be because of our wrong perception of the customer or wrong predictions of our models. So for example, if someone is really trying to buy a paint and if we, we are not able to predict their needs or understand their behavior, we would end up targeting or marketing them with, you know, some, with irrelevant product on its door. And then what will happen to customer experience in that case? Customer is going to be angry, unhappy, happy, probably not happy, right? But then, what is really customer experience, right? So if you think about it, customer experience is really the function of various business aspects. And one of them is marketing. And when it comes to marketing, there are the right, there are main few elements, such as right product, right time, and right place. And that's where our marketing data science teams comes into picture. So we work with a lot of customer data and also third party data, second party data and also work with a lot of other business stakeholders within the organization. And that includes media, uh, our operations, our IT partners, our business stakeholders, marketing, merchandising. So there are a lot of business partners that we work with just to support right customer experience and understand our customer needs. So how we, how we apply data science to identify right audience segments? As, you as we saw on the previous slide, we have a lot of data, right? And in today's world, data is a currency. Data is new currency. But then a lot of data is good. But then a lot of data also create new challenges, right? And unless you use that data and bring insights to the life, it won't be of that use. So how do we apply, how we use our data science or how we use our data to bring that to the life? We, we use machine, a lot of machine learning models to apply um, and then apply insights to the market. If you Google today, and you will see a lot of data science applications to the market. But in this case, I'm going to talk about the data science applications to digital marketing. So in our data science model, we leverage a lot of different, different data related to customer. So there are some first party data elements, First party, when, when I say first party, it's our Home Depot data. It's our sales data. Then also a lot of customer touch points. Home Depot, again, Home Depot uh, is the largest the world's home improvement store, right? So we have very rich customer base. So a lot of customer touch points. Then uh, and some third party data and some miscellaneous segments. And when we process this data and use our models, it helps us to identify right target customer person. And then it also helps to understand what is the customer's purchase intent? What are they really looking for? What they really need? And then that also helps us to understand right product to market them. And this, so all in all this process, we leverage millions of records, thousands of features and hundreds of models. And it all happened in one cloud environment. And that really helps us to scale, not just to scale our models, but to use it efficiently, use our IT resources efficiently and identify the right target. And sometimes the window of opportunity is very small. So you, need, you just need to, so we need to act very fast, quickly, efficiently without hampering the quality and the predictions from our model. Then you will wonder what happens to these audiences, right? How that is related to personalization. So when our data science insights comes to the life, how it is look like, right? So let's, um, let's assume that someone is a you know, professional or contractor, right? The need of that person are very different from the DIY or you know, occasional DIY like me. 
I will only do you know some stuff like changing my light bulb, and that that might happen once a year or twice a year, right? So my product needs are very different from what other professionals need. So it's at that point it's very critical to understand what customer, but also what they need and when they need it. So, so that's why in marketing we look at the customer need and not what marketing wants. And with the help of our predictive models, we are able to understand the customer's product need, and then we are able to market those products to the customer based on when they need it, at what point, and uh, you know, at what price. And also, we, it's not, we just don't stop at that point. We also work with our media and marketing partner to provide very cohesive or integrated personalized experience to our customer. So if they, if so, if our in, our customer interacts with certain channels and they see our ad, they will see the similar ad about the similar product uh, that they need at that point. And that's what results. That's how we, um, you know, improve our customer experience, and that's how we help um, improve the customer brand loyalty. Thank you for, uh, you know, attend, uh, Thank you for giving me opportunity to talk to you, and I will then hand over to you. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yao, and I'm an associate data scientist on decision analytics here at Depot. So today, very excited to share uh, one project that my team and I worked on to evaluate model performance uh, by building an index of model performance metrics. And some of you might be able to utilize and apply this tool right after this presentation. Um, so to give some context on where this idea came from. So my team- Yao, just to interrupt, actually, we are not still able to see your uh, screen. Okay. <laughs> Sorry oh, about that. Sorry. Can I get us some sub if you can see my screen? No? Uh, not yet. Probably if you could just click on the screen, uh, like double click and start presenting, probably it will work. Okay. Can you guys see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, do you want us to share it for you? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Gracia, would you be able to share uh, the presentation? Yes, for us? I can share it. Give me a second. Thanks so much. You'll have to tell me when to advance to the next slide. Yes, thank you so much. Can you see it? Yeah, thank you. Um, would you go to the next slide, please? Sorry for the for the hiccup over there, um, but as I was saying, the original kind of goal of this project is to build a um, an index of model performance metrics so that we can evaluate time series models. Because my team has been working on building time series models for forecasting, um, and it's been very important for us to be able to quickly and efficiently evaluate model performance. Because as as you can think about. If we look at a particular region and a regional sales or a group a sales for a group of products, the number of models you have to train and scale can quickly get multiplied to hundreds, even thousands. And then we need to build a metric that would allow us to kind of go through multiple iterations and pick the best performing model for you to report out. Um, so that's kind of the original intent of building M MPI. And another uh, goal of this project is to really allow us to look beyond just accuracy and help us to evaluate performance from multiple aspects, such as in our case, we're also concerned about forecast consistency and we want to take into account of the complexity of the time series itself. Um, and also once you productionalize your models, you probably want to worry about computational uh, capacities as well. So we're really trying to build a kind of a scoring system that would tell us um, and help us to combine all those important aspects of evaluating a model performance. 
Um, and last but not least, we want to use MPI as a tool to help us derive at some root causes and diagnose model performance eventually, and then um, identify, help us identify some opportunities for improvement. So here in the middle, I kind of have an example of how an MPI works. Um, so for each metrics that we source, we would be able to generate an MPI score. And then when we, when we add up to all of the scores, that will give us an uh, total score for this particular model type. And that's the total score. We can use that to compare model on a high level. Um, but if you want to go down a grain, you can also calculate kind of the subtotal in each of the bucket that we came up with. Um, and then try to evaluate model performance by comparing those buckets. For example, you can have a time series model that's highly accurate, but not as consistent as model B, then you can leverage that insight to make a, uh, make a decision on which, which uh, prediction you want to report out. Um, so in this presentation, I will kind of quickly go through the steps you will take to create a uh, model performance index and share an example of where you can actually apply this tool. So first thing first, we went through a process of sourcing metrics, and this is where actually the customizing component really comes in and kind of depending on your project op uh, objectives and depending on um, kind of the type of products you, um, you have, you might have a very different uh, selection of performance metrics that I have here. Uh, but for the purpose of time series model, we're really concerned, again, about four um, areas of uh, evaluation. First, accuracy. We included some of the commonly used accuracy metrics, MAPES, MAPE, RMS, RMSP, and so on. Um, and consistency is um, an area that we're kind of interested in looking into. This will contain uh, one metrics that compare the variance of our predictions to the actuals, but also it will tell us if um, this model carries a forecast bias and if, if we can kind of unco uncover some opportunity to adjust that bias. Um, data complexity, this goes back to the fact that we're building time series model. And you can imagine in certain region for certain products, you might experience high volatility, high seasonality, and then we can uh, take that into account in the model performance index as well. And last but not least, machine size, processing time, uh, cost per hour are also available um, as metrics to evaluate in this, in this scoring system. So, in order to generate this, um, those MPI scores that I showed in this short example, we have to go through a model training process to generate these scores in a statistical and reliable way. And the model that we use is a credit scoring model. Um, but could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and before we can actually train a credit scoring model, we have to deal with the problem of unsupervised learning because in this case, um, we're classifying or trying to evaluate uh, model performance and we don't really have like a true value in that case. So this is kind of the art of the process where you come up with your own definition based on your uh, business understanding, based on your objectives and you establish a set of criteria to help you uh, go from a pool of models to a group of models that you call as uh, well-performed or good model types. And then you can use this binary um, target variable, which is good versus the rest of the, the model types to kind of build this MPI uh, credit scoring model. Um, and I won't drain this part, but it's mostly an iterative process where you finally feel good to say that, oh, this group of model, we validated with actual performance and we can call them as um, a group of good models. And that's mostly for the purpose of training this MPI scorecard. Um, and once you feel good about your target variable, you can go through the actual steps of training a credit scoring model. Um, and first thing first, we fit, we kind of transform those continuous metrics into categorical ones because the intent eventual goal is to extract those coefficients from a credit scoring model. You're able to say that, for example, maybe less than 10% would have a stronger relationship with the model that's performing well than maybe um, of greater than 40%. 
So once we run all those uh, performance metrics in this credit scoring model, uh, we will be able to extract those feature importance slash coefficients from this, um, this MPI model. And next slide. So the last step to create an MPI scorecard is to scale those coefficients into a certain range. So if you're interested in scoring your model from zero to 100, you might define that as your final range. But essentially the MPI scores are a representation of the coefficients from your credit scoring model. Um, and that directly tells you uh, how well and how, how well this level of metrics has a relationship with the model that's performing well. So then you went through the final step of scaling and um, last thing I'll share an example of using MPI and if you could advance the slide. So to give you kind of an example of how we're actually using this. So this is an example of forecasting for a specific regional product sales. And we trained three time series models to forecast for this uh, re particular region pro regional product. And we want to quickly tell which model we want to use, which predictions we want to report out. And we can automate that process by leveraging the total uh, MPI score. So the MPI score would be a combination of uh, multiple model performance metrics, but it eventually comes down to just one total number for each model. And in this case, we can easily tell that model one would be the best performing model in our, in our um, uh, in our model pool, and then that's the one uh, we will finally report out um, as our final predictions. So that's from a high level that how we can use MPI. And if you want to go down to kind of the diagnosis part, you can compare model one with model two and find out that the in-range prediction count is different for those two models. And that's because for model one, you're seeing all that outliers where I circled, um, where that's kind of dragging the model performance compared to model one. And that's kind of a simple example of where you can use a specific metric to um, diagnose and make distinctions between two model types and then go down to the next step of maybe um, analyzing the drivers, uh, fine tune your parameters so that model two will have a better performance than in this iteration. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty much what I have and welcome any questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. And I'll pass it to Megan. All right, can everyone hear me? Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Good to go. All right, well, thank you everyone for having me here. Let me adjust this little panel for a second so I can see the slides, but really just wanna say a huge thank you to Women Who Code for having us today. And also um, tons of great talks before this. I'm really interested. I've been writing down some notes so I can connect with the speakers offline. So um, thank you for that and connecting us in this way. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today I'm Megan Forrester, I'm a lead data scientist on the supply chain data science team. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're applying the principles and underlying understanding of reinforcement learning to some of the problems that we're being faced in the supply chain around yard productivity. And yard productivity can be broken down into multiple different problems that we're trying to solve, but we're gonna focus just today on how do we optimize where we park trailers in the yard to try to minimize distance and where we have to move them. So hopefully I can move to the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna start just really briefly and introduce to you guys the concept of the supply chain. And I'm sure you've heard that word a lot in COVID. It seems like a lot of supply chains have been impacted with um, demand or having manufacturing kind of backup. So this is something that's extremely relevant at the Home Depot as we support over the $130 billion worth of sales. And supply chain is really the mechanism that moves product from our suppliers or their manufacturing facilities to either in the customer home or to the store. So if you go into a Home Depot store, you'll see it stocked with all kinds of products from different vendors. And there needs to be some way to aggregate all of that product and have it there on the shelf for you so you can pick it up. And our supply chain is really broken down into three large organizations, which are our operations teams. And we think about them in terms of transportation, who actually moves the product or figure out how we should move the product from point A to point B. 
what carriers we should use. So if you think about those big trailers that you see on the highway all the time, they're kind of coordinating with carriers to get our product picked up. And then we have our distribution, par uh, distribution partners. These are the people that are actually working in the distribution centers. We have several different types of distribution centers. Some do cross stock function, some actually stock product. And it's really what we need based on being able to get product in the right place at the right time. And then finally, the inventory planning and replenishment team is really focused on trying to figure out how much product we should order and what service level we should supply it at so that you have your product. With that, I like how Jen kind of commented before about how everything's kind of, it takes a village to operate. We also have our brilliant analytics teams that help support and drive decision making. So they're in there with the data, figuring out how do we support our teams and provide insights so that they can action. Um, and that's something where our data science team kind of comes in as an additional layer. And we work really hand in hand with our analytics team where we try to generate systems that are self-learning systems that are not actually limited by just the known business logic. And we actually try to flip this classical paradigm that you can see here on the right-hand side on its head where we have our data and our rules. So we actually define the rules in our classical programming example. And when we have those rules, we can then generate answers, but that can be limiting in some ways, where instead maybe we wanna focus on the machine learning paradigm where we have, we not only provide the data, but we also provide the answer with it. And all we need to do is then find a function or a machine learning algorithm that will kind of map those two inputs together to generate new rules. And it may be outside of things that we traditionally think of here in the supply chain. So. That's really what our team is trying to focus on. It's not only um, just new technologies, but bringing in new algorithms that can help develop current principles and methodologies. So just as also Jen was talking about on her previous slide, so we wanted to think about some new ways that we could apply reinforcement learning here at the Home Depot in our supply chain. So if you're not familiar with what reinforcement learning is, I definitely recommend you after this going on to YouTube and watching the AlphaGo documentary. Um, something really great, um, some researchers at DeepMind, and I'll talk about that on the following slide, but really what reinforcement learning is, is the machine learning subfield that is focused on the science of decision-making. So the whole idea of this is we wanna try to optimize sequential decisions under some kind of uncertainty. So you may not be right 100% of the time, you have to make a decision and the outcome may vary. So the environment may be stochastic. And the difference here is you're doing it through a trial and error paradigm. You actually don't know what the answer is. You don't know the optimal mechanism um, in a certain situation, but you're trying to find the best possible path in a sequence of actions that need to be taken are taken. Below, you can see kind of a very uh, canonical example that you'll see this kind of time series loop or this interaction loop where you have an agent, it's kind of like a robot or a brain or something that's able to make actions in an environment. So it interacts with the environment by taking decisions or making actions. And with that, you get back some kind of what state you're in. So within the environment, you may move to the left, you may move to the right, and then you'll be in a new state and you need to understand where you are in the environment. And with that, the way that the agent determines whether or not it's doing well is by receiving some kind of reward signal or feedback, kind of like a temperature gauge to say how well you're doing at any given point. And over this entire kind of sequence of interaction and trial and error, trial and error paradigm, you start to learn a policy and a policy is really a behavior to try to improve over time to maximize some kind of reward signal. So the idea here, just to make it a little bit more concrete, there's a lot of great research going on. And this is one of a very simple example. And probably if you've read anything about reinforcement learning, this is probably a little bit of overkill, but there's a, a research team called Google DeepMind that's been working on using reinforcement learning algorithms and applying them in a bunch of interesting ways. A lot of it has been focused on trying to get an agent to learn how to play a game without being told the rules of the system. So they just inherently or natively learn the environment by getting reward signal. So in the example of Atari breakout, you actually have a bat that moves left and right on the screen and tries to keep the ball in the air for as long as it can. And it gets the reward signal at the top, which is the game score. And it knows if it's doing, get, doing well or if it's doing bad. And through this iterative process of playing the game, and it can actually learn, just like you see in this GIF image, how to keep the ball in the air so that it can be just as good or master that human level scoring. And they did this with the same algorithm, not only for breakout, but they also did it for 57, well, way more Atari games, but they were able to get master human level scoring in 57 of those. So moving on, I wanna kind of take it another direction. So hopefully that got you excited about reinforcement learning. And this is the problem that we're faced with at the Home Depot, which is yard productivity. So what you can see here on this uh, 
uh, on the slide is actually an aerial like view of our distribution center. So if you think about this one distribution center that we have, it's a cross dock facility where there's inbound dock doors that we actually unload product from trailers. And then we load product on the outbound side um, and send it to store. So in this kind of example, we have a lot of trailers that come in from all over the United States and they need to be parked in the distribution center before they're pulled to a dock door. So just think of a, a really large parking lot. And in this situation, we spend tens of millions of dollars every year trying to move the product around our distribution center yard. So any way that we can improve the process of parking our trailers, we can save money in switching. So that's actually moving the trailers, shuttling to offsites, which is going to another location, and then gas and equipment and labor. So right now, one of the challenge and opportunities that we're faced with is we have static logic. We have a lot of really brilliant engineers in the field that take on a lot of different tasks. And they've designed a system where we park trailers in zones. And when these zones become at capacity, it can cause a ripple effect where we have to park trailers in less ideal locations, which can actually take up space that another trailer may have needed to be parked, uh, parked in. And these zones are very specific to the type of trailer that comes in and the location and proximity to the dock door that it needs to be pulled to. The dock doors are equipped to handle certain types of products. So it's important that we put the right trailers at the right dock doors and park the trailers as close as possible to those dock doors. And another issue here is because we're so busy, we're Home Depot, we've got a lot of things going on as these, these kind of systems don't always get updated as frequently as we would like. So this is something we wanna try, try to take advantage of the reinforcement learning mechanisms to do this. So really quickly, just kind of framing the problem is starting with data is, we have a lot of data and this is probably pretty apparent with all of the previous conversations, but being able to try and prototype a problem as a data scientist is really important. So sometimes it's not great to boil the whole ocean at once. So what we did is we actually sampled just our data set down to something very small to test out our system. So if you think about a trailer that comes into the yard, so if someone gates in and they go to park the trailer, what we're focused on is the first action that we can take that we have control over. So that action is where do we assign that trailer position to? And then we know we can calculate what the probability it will go to a certain doctor on our distribution center. So that's something that's outside of our control that's handled by another system. So what we're trying to do is say, can we take a better action than we have previously? And another way that we subsetted our data or kind of took a sample of our data is just looking at trailers that have palletized product. Palletized product, you can see here on the bottom left-hand side, we have toilets that come in on pallets and they, that need to be offloaded by a forklift. So that just gives you a flavor of just because this trailer comes in doesn't necessarily mean they're all of the same type. So then the final piece of this is we had to map this out and set up this system in a way uh, formulated as a mathematical problem through the reinforcement learning lens. So this was creating a reward function that we could optimize over, uh, create a model of our environment so we could understand the dynamics of where we're gonna move to which dock door. The policy we're gonna look at, we call it the Q value policy. This is um, a, basically a, a variable that's used for what is the value of an action that I can take at this given moment, given the state that I'm in. And then we have some baselines we want to evaluate against, which is our random agent and the current yard management service policy, which is what's actually being used at the Home Depot today. So the first way we did this, this is actually a really fun exercise. I, uh, one of my colleagues helped me figure this out, but we actually worked on just a very simple reward function, which is one over distance and the distance is in feet. So what we did is we mapped out every yard position, every dock door position in our yard and actually said, what is the distance there? And we created a matrix that says, if you can calculate the distance in feet, just get the reward matrix as one over the feet. So it penalizes longer distance moves. And we need this as a lookup table to go back to and say, what if we were to take this action parked at this location, what reward would we receive? One of the things that my colleague helped me with was trying to figure out how to calculate that when a path is blocked. So you know that trailers can't just drive through distribution centers, we need to consider that. The second part of the reinforcement learning framework is the model of the environment. And this is where we actually went and looked at the history of palletized trailers at the single distribution center and said, what is the probability that this trailer will move to this next dock door or another dock door? And that's kind of that stochastic environment we were talking about. Just because we park a trailer in one spot doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna go to dock door one or dock door two. So we just need a way to say, what is the probability that it will move to this next state? 
And then finally, we have to calculate in this very simple example, and I don't want you to think that this is the only way you can calculate a Q value, but this is the Q table that we used or kind of an idea of what the Q table looked like where we have states as our rows and any action we can select as our columns. And what we were trying to achieve was updating the actual values in this table. And this is our cheat sheet now. Once we filled in the values of saying, this is an example here in the middle, we have a palletized trailer, which of the yard positions that we could park in if the yard position was available to us at the time would give us the largest reward based on our one over distance um, formulation or our reward function. So we use matrix multiplication to achieve that. And then we wanted to test this and evaluate it both visually and against our two random and our YMS system. So what we essentially did was we went back over the 10,000 trailers that came into the yard the last year and allowed our Q table to dictate which yard position we would have parked in. So that is now our Q value policy that we used. So just kind of a visual representation, and I know this probably looks a little hairy if you haven't kind of seen this before, hopefully you can recognize that this is supposed to look like that aerial view before the different yard parking locations. The yellow to the green kind of dots there in the middle are actually the dock door locations where green means there's a higher probability that the palletized trailers will come to one of those positions. So they're the most highly visited dock doors. And hopefully you can very clearly see that the darker red location, kind of the dark maroon, is closer to those dock doors. So those are the actual Q values or the scale of the Q values. And as a reminder, they're only like incremental, one over distance becomes um, only decimal points. So the, the, the scale isn't extremely like, you don't understand it immediately, but um, the lighter salmon colors is something you can see off to the right-hand side. They're farther away from those probabilistic dock doors. So these are the ones we would say that we don't wanna park there if we have better options available to us that are closer. So this gives us almost like a sliding scale of all we can rank the yard positions that would work best for us for this, this certain dock door. And then finally, this is my last slide, but really just to give you an idea of evaluating against a baseline. So it's always good, it's cool to go make some algorithms or to kind of write some Python code and see what it looks like, but you really need to know how you stack up against um, some other kind of metrics out there. So what we did is we actually calculated the average reward and total reward the average distance and total distance. And that's what you can see here. And I don't want you to focus too much on the reward because that's just a proxy for our optimization kind of setup. And really the big thing here is the total distance miles over all episodes. So if we took the palletized trailers and looked at it as a total population, it's only 8% of all of the trailers that come into the yard. And this is only one distribution center. So our Q value policy was able to reduce the amount of miles driven over the course of the year that we evaluated by 15%, or that is about equivalent to 300 miles. So if we were to scale this out to other trailer types, hopefully we could see even more benefit, maybe save on some of those gas dollars that I was talking about before. So again, as we expected, our random agent performs pretty horribly. Um, it doesn't do any better than the YMS policy because our agent is just selecting yard positions at random. Our YMS system has a little bit more intelligent design where we've selected zones that would um, park our trailer as close as possible, but our Q, Q value policy did edge out both of them and that negative 15%. So really the next stages of this are expanding the scope, scaling the solution and trying to incorporate more features or think about a new reward function. So that is all that I have today. And I think we can switch over to the Q and A. Thank you all for having me. Thanks so much. Uh, it was really interesting, uh, all the talks. Uh, Thanks so much to all the speakers. In the chat, we can see like people are finding it really interesting to know all the real world use cases of uh, machine learning. So we know about machine learning, but in variety of ways they are being used is really fascinating. So uh, we are almost at the end of time, but uh, we have still some unanswered questions in the Q&A, so probably let me just quickly uh, go towards them. So, uh, Prishali, you mentioned like you want to answer one question uh, live. So the question is, is there a branch that studies the sweet spot between ads being too annoying and off-putting and effective? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, and we all run into that issue all the time. So there's really, uh, it's really about the media sciences where you know, try, you can try to understand 
what is the sweet spot and where uh, marketing dollars are used for them. So that that something comes under media sciences. Great. Also, we have another question. Uh, it says, where are most of the algorithms implemented? Example, is it in client side, business logic, or SQL on the website? Do anyone like to take that question? I think with the panel, you've seen a variety of implementation options, right? So uh, specifically to online, it, it is eventually most of our algorithms are customer facing. Um, so yes, client side, but there are analytics applications. Megan's use case obviously is going to be implemented differently uh, through the supply chain deployment system. So I, I would say it depends on the use case. Great. Uh, probably I will take one more question. So it's from Alice. It says, if the data set has a lot of outliers, how do you handle this outlier when doing some supervised learning models? All right, I'm struggling with finding the mute and unmute. Um, we normally use Teams, so I feel like I'm a little Zoom, um, a little behind on Zoom, but I would say it really depends. And I don't think you should ever just throw out outliers with trying to, without trying to understand really what the meaning of them is. There are some situations and really it will depend on the model type that you've chosen where outliers will play a big part. So say you wanna use a linear regression, it's probably more likely that you would need to do some kind of um, say within this 90th percentile confidence, like these are the data that's gonna make up most of this type of say a certain variable and you probably need to go variable by variable and try to understand those certain features. Um, you may not need that. So say linear regression, you may have to do something like that where you actually exclude outliers based on a feature set or you need to do some kind of imputation. Um, but other than that, if you're using something more like a random forest, you may not have to worry about so much outliers. It's something that could be handled internally within the algorithm. So I feel like we're giving a lot of it depends situation, but it's really good to kind of understand that. Don't just exclude things off the bat. Try to understand because that could actually tell you a lot about the underlying customer segment or some things that you may need to introduce later in your implementation. Awesome. I think that was it uh, for today. So finally, again, I would like to thank the Home Depot and all the amazing speakers today. It was really insightful and very interesting for our attendees. And also I'd like to thank Gracia, our program manager for setting up this uh, event and helping with all the organization. And also uh, I'd like to thank our moderator for today, Ishita, who was uh, helping in the chat uh, others. So thank you everyone. I wish you all have a great rest of the day or evening, depending on where you are and see you next time probably. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone.